Round Kiva temples are set deeply in the ground. The ancient architects probably took advantage of natural cavities in the earth. Here, worshippers were protected from storms and animals. Their holy temple, where shamanistic magic rituals were performed, probably looked similar to this restored kiva in Aztec, north of Chaco Canyon. The centerpiece of the room is a fireplace. Next to it are two stone tubs, whose function remains a mystery. Perhaps they served as treasure chests for religious objects. The roof is supported by four giant tree trunks. Some kiva roofs were built to be flush with the ground, while others were raised slightly above the natural terrain. Early Spanish explorers ignored Chaco Canyon and its people. A few Navajo Indians settled in this area, but even they had no relationship with the Anasazi culture. This was a region left untouched until a hundred years ago, when a cowboy discovered artifacts in Chaco Canyon. He received financial support for excavations, and a strange discovery was made. No burial grounds and few human bones were found. Was Chaco Canyon populated by pilgrims with no settled population? These scientists researched and filmed during all four seasons. Studying the role nature played in this region might help them to understand the mysterious Anasazi culture. In addition to the ruins, the Anasazi left other silent witnesses. Unusual rock paintings reveal a rich imagination. But they also raise other questions. Why did these people, who were master builders, never develop a written language or hieroglyphics as the Mayas did in the south. Perhaps a choice was made. Written notation may have been considered a desecration of their magical culture. The flute player is a motif found all over America from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego. The sweet tones of flutes made of wood, stone or bone traditionally express the soul's longing for eternity. Numerous depictions of animals represent the Anasazi's understanding of the connection between humans, nature and all of Earth's creatures. The explorers ask anthropologist Alfonso Ortiz, a Tawa Indian, what he knows about the Anasazi. They saw themselves as being a part of the earth. They saw themselves as belonging to the earth, not the other way around. Uh, and it's a very profound difference because uh, European man, at least by behavior, if not by creed, has behaved as if the earth belonged to, to him and, or to them. The ancient Chacoans believed otherwise. They put their lives in rapport with the earth. And that is evident everywhere, especially in their architecture, which may be their most enduring and powerful material accomplishment. The astronomical knowledge gained by the Anasazi is just as impressive. They studied the sun's movement at a fixed point on the horizon. Then, using a type of horizon calendar, the Anasazi placed important occurrences in time. Religious ceremonies, the winter solstice, sowing times and periods of harvest were all specifically dated. The Anasazi who settled in the outlying areas did not rely entirely on the people of Chaco Canyon for astronomical calculations. They devised their own calendar systems. 
The village of Holly lies 125 miles north of the canyon. Here, Anasazi Indians carved three sun spirals into a very special spot. At dawn, light fell in a horizontal line. But only during the summer solstice does a bar of morning light fall directly through the three sun spirals. Another example of the Anasazi's astronomical awareness was discovered 20 years ago, high on a lone mountaintop in Chaco Canyon. Here, during the winter solstice, the midday sun forms two glowing daggers, which frame an ancient sun spiral. The separation of light is caused by rocks that stand in front of the spiral. Whether the rocks were positioned by nature or by the Anasazi is still a mystery. During the summer solstice, a single dagger slashes the center of the spiral. Scientists believe this was not merely an observation site, but rather a sacred place where tribal rituals were conducted. People may consider the Anasazi more primitive than us because of the power they entrusted in their natural surroundings. But perhaps there is great wisdom behind their deep connection to nature and their respect for the magic of life. In addition to studying the sun and star signs under open skies, the Anasazi included places for observation in their homes. A window in Pueblo Bonito, set at an odd angle, baffled archaeologists until astronomers made an interesting discovery. During the winter solstice in December, the rising sun could easily be seen through the window, saving the Anasazi an ice-cold trip to an outdoor observation point. winter solstice neared, the window began to reveal the break of dawn. And on the exact day of the winter solstice, the sun's rays fell directly into a corner designed to catch them. of Chaco Canyon in the southwest USA is an area surrounding a mountain presently called the Sleeping Ute Indian. Here in Hoven Wep, ruins of an Anasazi Indian outpost have been preserved. Two holes the size of fists are found in the walls of one of the rooms. One opening looks toward the northwest and through it, the sun can be seen setting during the summer solstice in mid-June. The second hole faces southwest, the direction in which the evening sun sinks to the horizon in mid-December, the time of the winter solstice.
Each winter morning brings a new dance of light and shadow to the region. The interplay of colors and shapes is truly magical. Scientists have drawn conclusions about the Anasazi's lifestyle from excavation sites. Fragments of clay pots, animal bones, corn cobs, carbonized wood, stone tools and woven sandals were found. More valuable artifacts like jewelry and ritual objects were discovered, mainly in shrines and in the niches of temple walls. Shells indicate trade connections as distant as the coast of Mexico. This bone trowel displays an inlay of turquoise. The nearest turquoise mines are 93 miles south of Chaco Canyon. Mother of Pearl also came from Mexico, as did colorful parrot feathers and small, extremely rare copper bells. The ceremonies in which they were used remain a mystery. The Anasazi were masters of architecture and astronomy, but as far as arts and crafts were concerned, their work was that of apprentices. In the Anasazi Museum in Dolores, scientists use an Anasazi skull to recreate the appearance of these ancient people. In Masa Verde, researchers have built models displaying each important step in the Anasazi's development. First, we see them as gatherers, basket weavers, and hunters. The next phase shows their sunken houses, which were dug into the ground to protect the Anasazi from storms and their food from hungry animals. The round Kiva temples must have been developed during this phase of Anasazi history. Later, using carved stones, wood and mud, they built upwards. This semicircle faces south to collect the warmth of the winter sun. The houses set below these cliffs mark the end of the Anasazi era, the final examples of the glorious period of construction in Chaco Canyon. Why were some towers built in the depths of the canyon and others on top? Alfonso Ortiz believes this is symbolic of one of the Anasazi's views of creation. They believed their people were born from the earth as insects and small animals that eventually developed into humans. Now they looked to the sky. Scientists know that Chaco Canyon has suffered a drought for decades, while areas close by remain relatively damp. Reasons for the drought are debated. Wood samples taken from the ancient temples reveal weather patterns and date the structures. This beam is ponderosa pine. It's from a very large tree. And this beam was originally a pilaster in a great kiva at Chetroquetl, which is a large ruin in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. As you can see, it has been squared and the back has been smoothed. It uh, probably was originally perhaps three to four feet long. So it probably weighed a great deal, and uh, we don't know whether 
it was actually shaped where they cut the tree down, which was a long distance from the site. The wood and carbonized tree trunks are examined under a microscope. The scientist draws a long line to represent each of the tree's wide rings. Short lines represent the weaker, thinner circles. The completed graph will show an overview of the weather pattern for a particular time period. The dating procedure is simple. Denny, I had this plot from Chetro Kettle I want to show you. I think it looks pretty good. Dated wood samples from the region are compared with the tree trunk whose age is a mystery. Right there. Yeah, there, there it is, is right there. there. It looks yeah. like the BB signature right there. And it looks like it goes out to about 1054 with almost no missing rings at all. Right. It's a good specimen. Right. These diagrams show the process in a simplified form. The top log shows the ring pattern of a living tree. The number of rings reveals its age. Older dead trees and wood from an Anasazi ruin are compared to the living tree's ring patterns. Exact climate charts can then be created. The red areas represent great dry periods, while the blue stands for above average rainfall. In Chaco Canyon, there were hardly any great rains between 1255 and 1285. In fact, this was an extremely dry period. The 30 years of drought in Chaco Canyon may have forced the Anasazi to leave their homes. But why did they not rebuild elsewhere? Could it be that the continued drought led to mistrust and suspicion towards their priests? The Anasazi worshipped the sun and the stars, and the priests had failed to predict correct harvest and sowing times. Living in harmony with the heavens was essential for the Anasazi's way of life. Could the puzzling natural changes have caused them to lose faith in their religion? If so, there was no reason to create a great center like Pueblo Bonito elsewhere. Professor Ortiz has another theory. It seems the observational powers and predictability that they had built up, the knowledge they had built up, began to fail them. So I see the drought not as the cause by itself, but as just a symptom of why they left. I suspect that there's something very, very much to this notion that People stepped back when something failed them, and they just walked away from it. And to the kind of evolutionary thinking that has dominated archaeology, this is, of course, like witchcraft. You just don't dare believe that, uh, because you're supposed to get more and more complicated all the time. You know, you're supposed to keep on going, getting ever more complicated. And if you hadn't reached a state yet, you're supposed to keep on going until you reach statehood. But the idea of drawing back from complexity because of the fear that, you know, what you created may be a monster, and going back to simpler times and to simpler, a simpler way of life, that is a hypothesis that at least has to be considered. Because this seeming collapse happened too many times in various places around the Americas. Perhaps the Anasazi did consciously decide to retreat from the high level of civilization they had developed to a simpler, earlier natural order. Perhaps their all-pervasive religion had failed to provide the control and predictability upon which they depended to safeguard their precarious lives. We do know they deserted Chaco Canyon. Yet 50 years later, a small group of Anasazi once again built their elaborate structures this time on the high plateau of Mesa Verde, a 14-day journey north. But this cliff palace was also abandoned after 50 years. The last of the Anasazi left their magical world, complex buildings, rock drawings, 
astronomical clocks and star signs and wandered off into memory, leaving only a sense of mystery and wonder. Hollywood immortalized the ferocious image of the Apache. In the movies, they appear out of nowhere and fight without mercy. In the early 50s, the movies flirted briefly with the idea of Apaches as noble savages. But more often, they were portrayed as scarcely human. At the height of the Indian Wars in the 1860s and 70s, the Apache did terrorize huge areas of the Southwest. They descended on the farms of pioneer settlers, seizing their livestock and killing anyone who stood in their way. But their violent raids were a response to more than three centuries of struggle against European settlers, whose behavior could be equally brutal. Through superior tactics, the Apache repeatedly humiliated far better equipped forces. And for a decade, the indomitable Apache leader, Geronimo, resisted capture when all other tribes had given up the struggle. Between 1861 and 1871, the United States government spent $38 million and lost over a thousand men trying to capture Geronimo and his followers. The story of Geronimo's heroic struggle is compelling. Yet there's more to the Apache heritage than its history of violence. Archaeology reveals that for centuries, they were resourceful hunters in the Rockies and the Great Plains, trekking hundreds of miles to engage in peaceful trade. So where did these tough and resilient people come from? And what eventually drove them to adopt the warlike raiding which made them so feared? At their ceremonial grounds in southern New Mexico, the Mescalero Apache are performing an ancient ritual that will go on for eight days. The ritual celebrates the coming of age for the young girls of the tribe. Dressed in traditional buckskin clothing, they undergo hours of blessings, prayers and dances that will bring strength and wisdom to themselves, the whole tribe. On stage, the girls run in four circles to reenact the journey of life from infancy to old age. Mescalero Apache Donna Lynn Torres. It's an important event uh, because the Apache maidens are being honored. It's a rite of passage ceremony, and therefore it shows that the maidens have become uh, women and are going to be accepted into the world as women now. Though it's a solemn occasion, the ceremony brings family members and spectators from far and wide to celebrate. The families of each young girl provide food and gifts to all. And even the traditions of the white settler have their place. But the climax to the right is the dance of the mountain gods. The dancers' masks and bodies are decorated with symbols referring to the four sacred directions of the earth the four grandfathers who hold up the sky, and the four days in which the world was created. Tradition says the Apache were created on the fourth day. In 
One way that the origin of the Apache can be traced is through their language. Donna Torres, like many Mescalero Apache, is fighting to preserve the culture by keeping her language alive. Five major Apache tribes are scattered widely across Arizona and New Mexico, yet all speak dialects of the same language. People from these tribes can easily understand one another, suggesting that the Apache are relative newcomers to the Southwest. Most archaeologists think they arrived around 1500 AD. So where did they come from? Their language holds a second clue. Apache belongs to a family of Native American languages called Athabascan. Most other Athabascan languages are found in the Pacific Northwest and in the rugged mountains of Western Canada and Alaska, suggesting that the Apache migrated far from their traditional homeland. But why would a people adapted to life in the north trek thousands of miles south through the Rockies, eventually settling on the fringes of the Great Plains? Archaeologist David Carmichael has pondered the puzzle of Apache origins. One suggestion is that uh, Athabascans received uh, bow and arrow technology that gave them a hunting advantage and allowed them to be more efficient hunters and therefore follow migratory game herds down the front of the Rocky Mountains. Another possibility, another possible factor is that by the time the Athabascans would have reached the Central Plains or certainly the Southern Plains, other population movements on the plains would have affected them. And in fact, they were being pressured by groups like the Comanche, who were also moving around on the plains. The high plains of northwest Texas, a vast expanse of level prairie once teeming with buffalo. Ever since the end of the Ice Age, hunters camped here, thriving on the big game that congregated around springs and rivers. Each summer for the past 21 years, archaeologists have come back to this spot, Lubbock Lake, to dig up the remains of ancient campsites. Perhaps the most intriguing evidence was left behind by the Apache. They first camped here less than a century before the coming of the Europeans, whose arrival would transform their way of life and plunge them into bloody conflict. For centuries, the Apache clung to their mobile existence, often traveling dozens of miles a day in pursuit of game. From an early age, Apache youth were trained for extraordinary feats of endurance. Elders taught children to break through the ice to swim in frigid rivers at dawn, and to hold snowballs in their arms until they melted. Early Spanish settlers commented that Apache runners could easily outpace horses across craggy terrain. It takes a sharp eye to recognize an Apache campsite. Like all hunters, the Apache traveled light and frequently covered up their trail to avoid detection by enemy tribes or Spanish patrols. What little they left behind reveals a lot about how they lived. Even though this just looks like a pile of rocks, we're on an agave roasting site here, and this is an, an earth oven that was used to bake agave, one of the most important carbohydrate sources for the mescalero and for all of the, the tribes in the southwest. We can tell that it's a cultural feature because we have a characteristic far-cracked rock here. It's been burnt by intense heat that occurs over the four days of the pit baking. We also have a characteristic ring midden shape here which is a circular outline of rocks that have been deposited around me here. And that, that resulted from uh, excavation of the feature uh, after the, the baking was done. The food was cooked, it was opened up to take the food out, and the burnt rock was discarded right in a ring, right around the outside. We also occasionally find artifacts associated with these features that give us more of an, a clue as to what they're used for. This one was found up behind us here a little ways. It's a, an agave knife made out of limestone. It's been resharpened on the edges here chip to make it sharp, and would be used like this to cut off the base of the leaves in preparation for baking. Other Apache artifacts sometimes come to light in surprising ways. 
Ant hills provide some of the best evidence for Apache sites in this area because the ants remove things like trade beads, glass beads, glass flakes, flint flakes that are buried under the ground. We wouldn't see them otherwise. On previous visits, we found quite a few artifacts in these ant hills. Trade beads, glass flakes, including red glass, which is quite rare in this area, almost certainly coming from discarded railroad lanterns and dating to about the 1880s. But it takes more than a few ants to unearth traces of the earliest Apache and figure out why they became raiders as well as hunters. At Lubbock Lake, archaeologists have found ancient campsites on high ground overlooking a bend in the river. Further down in marshes close to the water, the hunters butchered the animals they caught. Radiocarbon dating indicates the Apache first camped here around 1450 AD. Archaeologists know they were Apache because they left behind finely worked arrowheads and pottery fragments resembling well-documented Apache artifacts of the historic period. There were plenty of reasons that drew the Apache to camp here, as archaeologist Eileen Johnson of Texas Tech University has discovered. She's excavated at Lubbock Lake for the past 21 years. Uh, the Apaches came to this particular area for the same reason, I believe, as all other groups of people have come uh, to the Lubbock Lake landmark. It's because of the permanent water supply uh, in the form of springs. We have had water at this place for at least 20,000 years. There has always been water here. And with water, you have vegetation. With water and vegetation, you have animals. Jimmy Morning Talk is calling the spirit of the bison. Just as his ancestors may have done when these mighty animals roamed the high plains around Lubbock Lake 500 years ago. talking about just a few bison. This would have been a fairly sizable herd that was uh, slaughtered here and processed, far more than what a small group of people would have needed for daily subsistence. If we could visit Lubbock Lake then, we would see a flurry of activity around the slaughtering and processing of the bison carcasses. Bison were processed on a big scale because the Apache were entrepreneurs as well as hunters. Their trading partners were the ancestors of the present-day Pueblo peoples of the Rio Grande, who lived in settled farming communities like Taos and Pecos. Early Spanish settlers left us accounts of the Apache visits to the Pueblos. Every year they arrived with dog sleds loaded down with hides and dried meat. The hides became so popular that at Pecos Pueblo, nearly everyone wore them in winter. In exchange, the Apache got corn, beans, turquoise ornaments, and clothing. At first, relations between the Spanish and the Native Americans were friendly. But by the 1590s, adventurers like Vincente de Zaldivar began terrorizing the Pueblos. With a handful of followers, Zaldivar climbed this soaring butte to reach the Sky City, a coma pueblo in New Mexico. For days, he massacred the defenseless men, women, and children of Acoma and burned their homes. Yet, even after this slaughter, Zaldivar traveled through hundreds of miles of Apache-held territory unscathed. Sometimes they even provided him with guides and food. The Spanish introduced an element into the Southwest that would change life there forever. The horse. At Lubbock Lake, archaeologists are finding evidence of the changes that eventually swept away the old hunting and trading lifestyles of the Apache. Horses were a very important aspect to the Apache economy. Uh, in two different ways. Uh, one of the first uses that the Apaches had for the horse was as a food source. 
And here at Lubbock Lake, we have uh, documentary evidence of horses being used as a food source. It's one of the few sites where this has been recovered. Uh, the bones of butchered horses we find in amongst the bones of butchered bison. Uh, but of course, the Apaches also then were, uh, used the horse as a pack animal and uh, rode them. Horses shifted the balance of power on the high plains. When the Comanche acquired horses and guns in the early 1700s, they invaded the Apache lands and pushed them out, driving them into what is now New Mexico and Arizona. There, Apache ran into the growing number of Spanish who captured and sold them as slaves. The Apache retaliated by stealing Spanish horses and cattle, an easier and more reliable source of food than hunting. Horse raiding quickly became an enormously successful enterprise. In the 1690s, one Apache band is said to have stolen 100,000 horses. The Apache weren't interested in getting rich. At the Santa Fe market and elsewhere, they traded surplus horses for guns and ammunition. The violence gradually escalated, turning the Southwest into a dangerous frontier for the Spanish. After a period of raiding, uh, it was pretty clear to the Spanish crown, Spanish officials, that they were not gaining control of the frontier. And a different approach was tried. Starting in 1790, peace establishments were set up by the Spanish at Presidios. And Apache groups were encouraged to come in and live peacefully at those establishments, and they were given food rations. So there's a, a recognition on the part of the government that there was a, an economic basis for the Apaches raiding. And that was a very successful program. So successful that within five years, there were some 3,000 Apaches living in these establishments and they were actually beginning to, to put a burden on the finances of the Presidios. But with the Mexican Revolution of 1821, Spanish rule ended in the Southwest. The newly formed Mexican government decided that the food rations program was too costly and ended it. The Apache were faced with the choice of raiding or starvation. So a new cycle of violence erupted. Mexican bounty hunters roamed Apache lands, collecting scalps for profit, while vengeful Apache redoubled their raids on Mexican settlers. But as the westward pressure on Indian lands mounted, conflict with the white eyes became inevitable. The earliest photographs of Geronimo were taken when he was already 60 years old. By then, he had already defied the United States Army for nearly a decade. His courage in battle was the product of a vision. After Mexican troops ambushed and killed his mother, wife, and three children, Geronimo heard a voice calling his name and telling him that no bullet could ever kill him. Today, he is remembered as a hero with special powers by the people of Mescalero, such as Beryl Cancia. Geronimo was uh, a warrior and a medicine man. He uh, had uh, special talents uh, given to him in a sacred manner. And uh, he, he led his people uh, during war, and uh, this is how he was looked up to. Uh, uh, he, he did some things that uh, an ordinary person would not do. He had great leadership abilities. In 1875, the United States decided all Apache would be consolidated in a handful of reservations in Arizona and New Mexico. Geronimo and his tiny band of followers were declared official enemies of the United States. Three times he surrendered, but on each occasion managed to elude his captors and flee to his mountain stronghold in the Sierra Madre. Near the end, 5,000 United States soldiers were bent on capturing a mere 16 Apache warriors who remained at Geronimo's side. While an enraged United States public fumed at the army's inability to bring the outlaws to heel, Geronimo continued unrelenting attacks on the Mexicans he hated. In five months, it was alleged, he killed 500 to 600 Mexicans. But in September 1886, Geronimo finally surrendered. At Fort Bowie, the dejected warriors and their families were assembled and shipped by train to imprisonment at Fort Marion in Florida. Conditions were so harsh and unsanitary 
that within a year 23 of the Apache children had died. The surviving children were separated from their parents and sent to a school in Pennsylvania. The rest of the captives were eventually moved to more healthful conditions at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where Geronimo took up farming. They remained the government's prisoners for nearly 30 years. By the turn of the century, Geronimo had become a celebrity. At a 1905 exposition, Geronimo performed what was billed as the last buffalo hunt. It was a final irony for the Apache leader. His people had been driven off the plains and forced to give up their ancient buffalo hunting way of life at least 200 years earlier. That earlier period before the coming of the white man has yielded up its secrets here at Lubbock Lake. Long before the violent cycles of raiding and revenge, the Apache had roamed proud and free, trekking hundreds of miles to hunt and trade with their neighbors. Euro-American society uh, changes rapidly. There's new fads all the time, new fashions all the time. There's a certain um, adaptability of Apaches, but there's an underlying connection with the past, an underlying emphasis on tradition and a, and a, and a culture that, for which the, the earth is important and nature is important. And they have learned a, learned a way to get along with, with the natural resources that we haven't yet learned. They belong to this place, and you can feel that and see that uh, in their actions. At the time of his surrender, Geronimo said, while living, I want to live well. I know I have to die sometime, but even if the heavens were to fall on me, I want to do what is right. God is listening to me. The sun, the darkness, the winds are all listening to what we now say. a violent struggle with the white men, the Apache were nearly driven into extinction. Less than 500 were left of the Mescalero tribe when they were forced onto a reservation a little over a century ago. Long banned from holding any ceremonies, the Mescalero's revival of their puberty rite marks a rekindling of the tribe's spirit. A distant echo of a time before the white man came when the Apache roamed free across the plains and canyons of the southwest. Kiva temples are set deeply in the ground. The ancient architects probably took advantage of natural cavities in the earth. Here, worshippers were protected from storms and animals. Their holy temple, where shamanistic magic rituals were performed, probably looked similar to this restored Kiva in Aztec, north of Chaco Canyon. The centerpiece of the room is a fireplace. Next to it are two stone tubs, whose function remains a mystery. Perhaps they served as treasure chests for religious objects. The roof is supported by four giant tree trunks. Some kiva roofs were built to be flush with the ground, while others were raised slightly above the natural terrain. Early Spanish explorers ignored Chaco Canyon and its people. A few Navajo Indians settled in this area, but even they had no relationship with the Anasazi culture. This was a region left untouched until a hundred years ago, when a cowboy discovered artifacts in Chaco Canyon. 
He received financial support for excavations and a strange discovery was made. No burial grounds and few human bones were found. Was Chaco Canyon populated by pilgrims with no settled population? These scientists researched and filmed during all four seasons. Studying the role nature played in this region might help them to understand the mysterious Anasazi culture. In addition to the ruins, the Anasazi left other silent witnesses. Unusual rock paintings reveal a rich imagination. But they also raise other questions. Why did these people, who were master builders, never develop a written language? Or hieroglyphics, as the Mayas did in the south? Perhaps a choice was made. Written notation may have been considered a desecration of their magical culture. The flute player is a motif found all over America, from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego. The sweet tones of flutes made of wood, stone or bone traditionally express the soul positioned by nature or by the Anasazi is still a mystery. During the summer solstice, a single dagger slashes the center of the spiral. Scientists believe this was not merely an observation site, but rather a sacred place where tribal rituals were conducted. Some people may consider the Anasazi more primitive than us because of the power they entrusted in their natural surroundings. But perhaps there is great wisdom behind their deep connection to nature and their respect for the magic of life. In addition to studying the sun and star signs under open skies, the Anasazi included places for observation in their homes. A window in Pueblo Bonito, set at an odd angle, baffled archaeologists until astronomers made an interesting discovery. During the winter solstice in December, the rising sun could easily be seen through the window, saving the Anasazi an ice-cold trip to an outdoor observation point. As the winter solstice neared, the Anasazi who settled in the outlying areas did not rely entirely on the people of Chaco Canyon for astronomical calculations. They devised their own calendar systems. The village of Holly lies 125 miles north of the canyon. Here, Anasazi Indians carved three sun spirals into a very special spot. At dawn, light fell in a horizontal line. But only during the summer solstice does a bar of morning light fall directly through the three sun spirals. Another example of the Anasazi's astronomical awareness was discovered 20 years ago, high on a lone mountaintop in Chaco Canyon. Here, during the winter solstice, the midday sun forms two glowing daggers which frame an ancient sun spiral. The separation of light is caused by rocks that stand in front of the spiral. Whether the rocks were pers longing for eternity.
Morris, depictions of animals represent the Anasazi's understanding of the connection between humans, nature, and all of Earth's creatures. The explorers ask anthropologist Alfonso Ortiz, a Tawa Indian, what he knows about the Anasazi. They saw themselves as being a part of the Earth. They saw themselves as belonging to the Earth, not the other way around. Uh, and it's a very profound difference because uh, European man, at least by behavior, if not by creed, has behaved as if the earth belonged to, to him and, or to them. The ancient Chacoans believed otherwise. They put their lives in rapport with the earth. And that is evident everywhere, especially in their architecture, which may be their most enduring and powerful material accomplishment. The astronomical knowledge gained by the Anasazi is just as impressive. They studied the sun's movement at a fixed point on the horizon. Then, using a type of horizon calendar, the Anasazi placed important occurrences in time. Religious ceremonies, the winter solstice, sowing times and periods of harvest were all specifically dated.